Hi, I'm very pleased to, to be here today. Uh, it's also my first talk at a Ruby conference. So, <laughs> thanks, especially, you know, the first time you speak and the next speaker is Aaron, it's kind of a little bit terrifying, but well, I, I try to do my best. So I'm Christophe, uh, you can find me on Twitter and uh, GitHub. Uh, I come from Belgium, a tiny country in Europe between Netherlands and, uh, and France. And we are known to like beers and chocolates. And uh, in fact, I like beers and chocolates. We have a lot of different beers and different chocolates. I have, because I think we, we do the, the best chocolate in the world, I bring with me, I think, more than two kilos of chocolate. <laughs> so, <laughs> after the Aaron talks, what I propose is that you come by me, say hello, and take one piece of chocolate and taste what we do quite the best in, uh, in the world. Um, Belgium is also known to do some absurd things very efficiently, like uh, the previous government, uh, we needed more than twice the time than uh, the hierarchies they, they have need to, to build their own government. So it was about 550 days. And uh, well, we did pretty well with, uh, you know, just a resigning government. Uh, we, we, we succeeded to, to have very good economical uh, results since more than 10 years. So. You, you see uh, the kind of country we are. I'm the co-founder of Pool Review, so it's an automated code uh, review tool for Ruby. Uh, it's presented like that. If you don't know, we can talk that ab after the talk at the party, for instance. Um, basically, the idea is to give you feedback on your code so you can know how to improve it. And today I would like to start not with a software story, but with uh, a story from uh, my wife's job. She has, uh, every day, she, she goes to job to, with one goal, which is curing cancer. And she's a medical physicist, and she likes to play with big machines. So this kind of machines, the, the idea is to, to, to beam some electrons and photons in order to uh, to put energy at a certain place in your body. So it looks like that, you have different beams. And the idea is to deposit some amount of energy on the canker so you can burn it and eradicate it. So the problem with that is that you have some side effects, like uh, through the body you deposit other energy so you, you can burn the, the skin and organic tissue, you can induce other secondary cancer, so something that you need to take care of. It needs a lot of people. For one patient, it's about three nurses, one doctor, one medical physicist. It's very complex and you need to use complex program to calculate the doses of energy that you would like to, to deposit on the canker. It's long, it's not only the treatment, but it's also the diagnosis, the measurements, to position it correctly, the patient on the machine, to, to, to check if everything is, is goes well, and so on. And because of all of that, it costs a lot. Just for one treatment, you can count between $3,000 and $15,000 just for one treatment. That means that if you do one error, you can have an ineffective treatment, you can have some casualties like burning, like secondary cancer. It's costly and time consuming to fix the errors. You can break the equipment, the machine. That means that at the end, you, you will make the people busy to fix the error or to fix the machine. And finally, you cannot treat other patients and other cancer. So it's very important to try to do less uh, possible errors that you can. So she, as an engineer, she tries to do her best. And 
her best is to catch errors as early as possible and to mitigate the risk to do error. How she can do that, for instance, she has to check if the machine is working correctly. So on the left, you have a, a, a cube of uh, water. It's a good model of the human body. And they do some measurements to check if the machine uh, beams correctly. And uh, so you have the, the correct energy. So when you use a machine, you know that uh, it's, it's correct. Uh, you, you do also in vivo measurements. So during the treatment, you put some diode on the, the body of the person. So you can check again at specific points if the energy is correct. You need also to be sure that your calculations are correct. Um, you use pre-review pre or other program, um, other program to calculate uh, your, 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 your treatment. Or sometimes you just do some quick hand calculation to check the order of magnitude. You have to check also if the requirements have been met, like because the machine has some physical limitation or because if you go too high in the energy, uh, you know that you will induce other cancer, so you need to check those constraints. And again, one way to do that is to use peer review or to, uh, to follow some uh, ISO process. Uh, and for instance, in that process, uh, it, it, uh, it's noted that you have to do peer review and so on. It sounds probably familiar to you, and it's for a good reason and we will talk that later. The reason that we put those strategies in place is that because we are Im human. And, you know, like Homer, we make mistakes just because we are tired or, you know, inattentive or you just miss something. And because we are human and we know that we, are, you, we, we can fail, it's finally in it, your our decision to do something or not, as you know, if you have a pool and a baby, you don't have, you don't want to find your baby drawn in the pool, so you put in place some, some, some equipment, some safety nets to be sure to, to keep it safe. So what we can do in radiotherapy, we do it also in civil engineering, in manufacturing, and also in software development. It's what I call safety nets. It's the idea that you put in place safety nets so in case you fail, it will catch you up and uh, you, you can continue and uh, nothing blows up. So in an ideal world, you would like to have only one safety net that catch everything, but you know, there are no silver bullets. So you try to have different kind of safety nets to, to catch different kind of errors, and in the end, it's really a trade-off between the cost of safety nets, your knowledge, your skills, and also what you want to achieve. And the real idea with do safety nets is to get be to, to be informed. So you know, if there's an error and that you can catch it, uh, and you inform it, you can decide if you fix it or if you let that error in place. And in software development, I think the three command ones are test, static analysis, and code review. I will illustrate the, the, the three, uh, and for that, we go through a very simple invoicing application. I'm sure that everybody has already deal with that. So the idea of tests is that you can write before or after. That's not the question here. Um, in, the, in, the, in the invoicing application, you, tr you have different items in your invoice. Each item has a price and a quantity. And you would like that if the, the invoice is empty, that the total is null. And if you have different items, the total should be correct. And if you update the quantity of an item, for instance, you update also the, the total after. Very basic. We write the class invoice, initializer, the, the method to add the items, nothing very complicated, and the total method, 
that calculate the method. So we go through all the items and we sum over the multiplication of price and quantity. Okay, you run the test, everything is green. Yeah, you did a great job. And now, for any reason, you decide that you would like to make the total uh, an attribute member. You put it in the initializer. You update the total method. And you run the tests, and they're red. In fact, when you, you change your code, you, you did it too quickly and you miss it that it was important to reset the total at the, the beginning of the, the method. So because your tests were broken, you know there's a problem and you can fix it. So the idea of tests, their benefits is that they allow you to check the functionality of your software, only the functionality that you can think before, that you think how your software should behave. Um, if you discover some edge cases or some bugs after, afterwards, you can write those te regression tests to, to check if later uh, you, 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 the, the bugs are, are, are really fixed and that you deal correctly with those edge, edge cases. Of course, the, the tests have some drawbacks, like, you know, what are we testing? Are we sure that we test everything? So with test coverage report, you can have an idea how you cover your co code base. Um, has someone launched the test? Especially, you know, you don't ship your machine in production. So that's why it's important to automate the test with a CI and to have a test environment the closest possible to the production. And that's the typical question of manager who tests the test. Uh, there's also some strategy to, to be sure that your tests are correct with test mutation, like with the mutant gem. They basically, they change your code and uh, they verify that when you change the code, your tests fail. So that was for the test, for stati static analysis. There are some, there are a program that reads your code, they don't interpret your code, and they try to, um, to, to find, to underline problems in your, in your code. They try also to measure some specific characters, char char uh, properties, like if it's readable, maintainable. So here, yeah, I would like to handle VAT, which is a sales tax in Europe. It's quite complex. Basically, if you, come f if you sell from a given country, uh, to another country and that your customer is a company or not, you don't apply the same uh, sales tax. So, for instance, if I'm a Belgium company and I sell to a person or a company, I need to apply 21 person. But if I sell to uh, another European company, the rate is null and so on. So, it's complex. It's like that. We cannot do anything against that. So, it's complex. Uh, we have that feeling, but we have tool to measure that complexity, like FLOG, and the idea is to give you a score. If the score is high, uh, it's a kind of proxy to tell you that it's hard to read, and that means if it's hard to read, it will be hard to change, and there's, there is a high risk to introduce a bug. And you know, complexity at the end could like that, and you know, when you need to change a wire, you don't know where to start. That could happen in your code, so to be sure that uh, it's easy to read, you try to fix it as early as possible. Um, well, so it's complex, but we continue to, uh, to implement other things, like we would like to issue some quote, and a quote is basically an invoice, but with a given total. But the quote has also to handle the VAT, so we are very lazy and we copy-paste the, the, the VAT. Uh, that's okay, maybe at the beginning, but at certain point you need to remove that duplicate. Hopefully, even if you forget it, there is a tool that checks the duplicate. It's like Flay, and it tells you that you find two pieces of code uh, similar in different files. So we know that we need to refactor our total method, and we start by the beginning, 
we extract uh, the first part, which is the calculation of the subtotal. Um, so we create a new private method. We put that code in that private method. We do, we try to use uh, the reduce uh, idiom. Okay, the tests are green, everything is okay. But with Ruby or RuboCop, you can check that there are some flows in uh, that piece of code. In fact, if we come back here, we still have that local variable total, but it's useless and we have assigned something. It's useless because in the block, we have a parameter with the same name that shadow the, the local variable. That means that if you get, it's, it's a dead code and at certain point it could be a problem later. And the same when you shadow another variable, it's probably not the best thing you want to do. Hopefully with RuboCop or Ruby warnings, you can be informed of those problems. And because of that, uh, you can then refactor your subtotal uh, method and make it better. So with static analysis, you can check flows in your code and smells. Uh, you need to be sure that you run them, like the test, so you can use a CI with the gem dev tool or a specific great task. We use hosted uh, software as a service like Code Climate or OS pull review. You can get some false positive, of course. They are machine, they are not perfect. But they're probably not perfect, but they are better than us because each time you run them, uh, you'll be sure that if there's a problem and they are able to detect it, they will report you uh, that problem. And John Carmack, if you know it, it's the guy behind Doom, you know, ID3 software, the famous, very old video game. And uh, for him, it's really important uh, to use static analysis because maybe your automation will fail, but all failures are legend as a human. And the fact that the static analysis will be very consistent and that each time you run it, it will report the problem, you know, every single time, that value is very huge. So you have tests, static analysis, they, they help you to, to, to check functionality and if there are no problems in your code, but they don't tell you how you can improve your code. And code review for that is really, really useful. It's the idea to ask a colleague uh, how you could fix something to check your code, read it, if the naming is correct. And at the end, it's the idea to spread knowledge and for instance, oh, I don't know how to remove duplicates and your colleague know, he did, okay, you can extract the VIT uh, rate calculation, put it in a module and a specific method. And then you make it the total method very simple, only three lines and it's easier to read, and hopefully uh, you don't have any more duplicates. And indeed, when you run Flay, it, it didn't find any duplicates. We can go further and you know, extract everything that's related to a country in a specific dedicated country, uh, class, and to make it more meaningful when you test over it, and when you will run Flog, uh, you have uh, a lower, lower score of the complexity, that means it's more readable, and again, you inform that uh, you have a, a more readable um, code source. So the idea of code review is really to spread the knowledge, and with code review, because we are humans, we can check anything, but because we are humans, we cannot check everything every time. And that's why it's not, you know, the, the silver bullet uh, and it's very complementary with test and static analysis. So I've, I have uh, illustrated uh, the different kind of uh, safety nets that you, could, that you can put in place. And, you know, the, we don't do that without purpose. The, the, the real goal is that you want to reduce the cost and the risk to introduce errors in your code when you change it. Because more and more you wait, more it will cost you, 
if you can fix something at the moment you write the code, it's far cheaper than, you know, where it's too cheap in production and that it blow off your, 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 your product. And as Kilt said yesterday, uh, you can even be so confident in your code that you can go to continuous deployment. Ma Martin Fowler reminds recently that it's not about writing clean code to have the best quality, it's really about the economics. And because we are only humans, we want to do, the th we are lazy, and if we can do something in less time and with less money, I think we would be happy to do it. So with different kind of safety nets, you could be more confident to dare something and to go forward to, you know, just change your code and not be scared each time you change one line in your code base uh, that it could introduce a bug. So you just change it and if there's a problem, the safety nets will catch you and uh, you can continue without uh, any worriness. So, yeah, the reason if you have two options, A and B, and maybe you are too busy to improve, but with some time, you can make it better and you can go fa further and faster. So, the question, the, the last question is where you can start. I presented two different solution. Uh, just take a look at what you do today. If you do tests but you don't automate them, you should start maybe by, by that. Uh, if you do test and have a CI but don't do code review or static analysis, just pick a tool and uh, start to use it and try to find if it's useful for you in your workflow or ask a colleague to, to, to read each time you finish a feature branch to read your code and give you feedback. Just step by step, do a first one, a very tiny one, and uh, at the end you will reach, you know, probably uh, more, uh, you, you will uh, cover more distance that you can expect at the beginning. That's it, you can find the, the, the code I presented uh, in a Git repository. Each commit represents uh, a different step, and uh, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, or pull review, and don't forget, chocolate. <laughs> Thanks, Krishna. Uh, any questions for him? Hi. Uh, uh, thanks for the talk. I think along with Flock, Flay, uh, you sh I think you'd also talk about the security features using Breakman. Any thoughts on that? What I, what I think about security, bre security about uh, applications built using Breakman? Yeah, Breakman is yeah. is effectively uh, capable to 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 check your Rails application uh, and different kind of uh, security vulnerabilities. They could be simple, but they they are quite common mistake that you can do. So it's really useful to have Breakman uh, check your code and uh, be sure that at least the common errors. Uh, have been covered. Perfect. I think it should also be a part of your presentation. It was pretty cool. Uh, the, the other question I had was also around uh, having good coding guidelines can also help you recover from a lot of issues. Uh, sometimes you're converting a, a parameter in your controllers into a symbol and stuff like this. Uh, break my catches a lot of this. Yeah. But having these kind of code lines, are they going to be part of your repository? Because that would be really, really helpful. Uh, could, could you coding, coding guidelines towards how you go about uh, writing good code from from the start? Yeah. The excessive use of uh, you know instance variables or excessive use of symbols, and uh, how you code such that you're always writing code which is not going to get you a larger flock score. Are you going to have such coding guidelines written down somewhere? Um, not sure to have understand. Um, sorry. So. Try to to recap in other words. So, how could we use core to make it better from the beginning? Or so, simply put, uh, if you could add a little bit more content about Breakman and something about coding guidelines to okay. start programming to ensure that we get a good flock score rather than me running flock every time yeah. to reduce my score. Okay. So. 
um, guideline about that. I think it's um, at a certain point you can increase the complexity because you need to, to uh, when you refactor your code, uh, sometimes it's not important that your code is complex just because you need to move the things and find the, a good way to, to, uh, to the, the, be, the best way to, to abstract your things. So it's interesting to know it's complex because you can spot where are the problems. And when you spot the problems, you, you start to, uh, to, to refactor that part, but you don't care about the score. You just check them uh, frequently just um, until you, you, you reach a reasonable uh, uh, state where your code is more readable and simpler to read. And indeed, when you can split the things in different modules that are very simple and, and more short and, and shorter, uh, usually your score, your complete score for each module will be lower. Uh, in, in fact, what you do is you spread your complexity, but because you have individual modules, they are just, you know, very dedicated to a simple task, it's easier to, to understand and to read it, so it will be uh, uh, easier to change it without introduce a bug. Have, have I uh, answered your question? Yes, well, it's really well. Thank you so much. And, Thanks. Uh, apart from the chocolates, have you also got some Belgian beer for tasting? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. The problem with beers is that my flight were about 15 hours, and they, they are far more heavy than uh, chocolate, so if I, if I needed to bring 400 beers, I'm not sure that it will be feasible, you know. You would have been more popular than the gold age sponsors here. <laughs> that could be a good goal for the next one. Thank you.